Welcome to the Arium Podcast. This podcast covers topics related to cyber and human resilience. The content's geared towards owners and CEOs of small and medium-sized companies, as well as IT and cybersecurity leaders. My name is Ardo Kane. I do cybersecurity and incident response at Arium. Our episode today is with Mike McCabe from Cloud Security Partners, talking about cloud security and incident response. Mike, how are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, also, thanks for having me on the podcast. Magic I look sprinkled to in there because DEF CON um, follows it right I've up. I've seen a lot of your talks. So Rob and I are going to talk about Black Hat, that are pretty interesting before, what you're looking so forward to, you know, how to talk talking about some of these topics. Hat. Awesome. And I'm looking forward to kind of discussing, you know, what you're seeing lately with cloud security as well. And, you know, I'm, I'm only seeing the aftermath a lot of times. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the ransomware world, so I don't see a lot of the uh, nation level, state level threat actor stuff that you probably are running into. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in seeing about that. But before that, we ask everybody that joins, how do you start your day? <laughs> uh, panicked? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's not that bad <laughs> um, being a small business owner. But yeah, and normally you wake up and just kind of... Um, you know, it is fun doing running your own company and um, all the, wow, the that sounds different like things life. that are asked and, of you. Uh, Just wake up and kind of orient to the day and technology dig in. Thing. I think I for me and my role is interesting and since we're small, I do all the business stuff, else, but I still know, have to do a lot of the actual it's, technical work. So it's like for when, someone the, who likes the deeper doing you are in technology, the more you want to do some code here and then doing a lot of spreadsheets on the you know the other part of the day. But um interesting how that happens. So I just started my day by digging into what has been done that day. Now, like, uh, to just travel a bunch hyper focused on that. Really, so. <laughs> no, uh, no five a.m. yoga or cold plunges for me, unfortunately. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I need to get there. Um, I haven't gotten that level of discipline yet one late night and it seems to screw up the uh the entire routine so yeah but uh yeah uh, in cybersecurity, i also wake up with a sense of rage um so uh <laughs> you know <laughs> so that is uh that's cool to hear yeah um as far as cloud security partners and you know really kind of you know i've come into you from an ir perspective you know how how do we work together on IR, but uh, can you tell our audience a little bit about what you do and kind of what the what your organization does and, and what value you're adding to companies? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're a boutique cloud and application security company. So we're, we're mostly former developers um, and DevOps folks. I can't quite call myself a developer. People have, have paid me for my code, but I'm not sure if it was professional or not. Um, so uh, but do have some of that background and we have a smart team of consultants um, as well. So we work across people's technology stacks, mostly focused in the cloud security world. So a lot of cloud native applications and, and infrastructure, um, everything from security assessments, typical pen testing to cloud build outs, uh, cloud architecture, um, infrastructure as code. We've done a lot of work in that area. Um, so basically everything across the stack, if you need smart folks to either tell you, you know, about the risks you have in your environment or help you get them fixed, we usually can help you out. Um, so an and have some I'm real conversations. personally dealing with that servers sense. that have been hacked. So whether they're in the cloud or on-prem, usually it's virtual machines and occasionally containers, but usually virtual machines that I'm having to deal with. That have, you know, most of the time get ransomware. Uh, although there may be other you know, precursors and other things that I'm dealing with. You know, it may be uh, that a box was used as a staging area or that it was used for exfiltration and things like that. So uh, those are the kinds of kind of IOCs that I'm used to seeing is, you know, uh, kill scripts on machines to, to kill critical services and, and you know, uh, automated tasks. So it's actually changed for me over the years. And, and to, um, uh, you so know, I used to be the chief security the, officer the for is, Las Vegas you know, Peace really which is with this, a smaller uh, conference, about 3,000 people that runs parallel you know, to Black Hat. As well um, as so any kind of for a few work. years, I was... When you're in a infrastructure as code space, and when you're, when you're dealing with things that are not VMs, what kind of incidents do you guys usually see? 
Yeah, we've we've done a decent bit of cloud-based IR because we have customers who, uh, customers and partners who, unfortunately, you know, people still get hacked, and um, and a lot of it comes down to credential leakage. Um, the classic hard-coded AWS creds in a repo, someone accidentally pushes to a public repo instead of their private repo, or um, you know, just exposes them somewhere. We see that quite a bit, which is where people jump in and find those creds and, you know, used to be set up the crypto miners, things like that. These days we see more of, it's not traditional ransomware, but it is, hey, I dumped all your S3 buckets. I dumped out your RDS instances, pay me whatever, um, or we're going to, you know, sell this on the dark net. Um, so still see a lot of that. And it really does come down to uh, bad user credential management, either keys or just password spraying, things like that. So nothing's really different in that regard. Um, it is an interesting working, you know, a lot of forensics has been about servers, server images, logs, all those types of things. In the cloud, yep. there's less of a focus <laughs> on that. And there's more of a focus on what is happening at the control plane. So, you know, what are these keys doing? What is this user doing? How are they pivoting from, all right, I have access to, you know, this role on this server, how do I get access to more information, more data, or create users, create backdoors, things like that. So a lot of it is still log review, understanding what, you know, threat actors are doing in these environments. Um, so it's not completely different, but, you know, the cloud is really interesting because there's, we've always built things with a traditional network perimeter. And in the cloud, since the API is all public, API is all public, there's no real perimeter anymore. You know, those keys are going to work just about everywhere. Yep. Um, so it's a lot of understanding <laughs> what's happening at the control plane layer versus what's happening on each individual Absolutely. server. Um, so that's, you know, somewhat of a difference there than the tr traditional IR and forensics, but um, a lot of the same, you know, skills and a lot of the same activities still happen there. So. Well, in addition to doing kind of that IR forensics, looking at the at the you know cloud interface and seeing what happened, you guys also do deep dives into the code of people's applications as well and kind of look at the security of that or the architecture of that. Um, how do you do that specifically? Is it more of a manual code review or do you have automation systems that you put code into? How does that work for you guys? Yeah, we're we're a mostly manual driven company. Um, you know, you know everyone's I think trying to make sales. Space, there's been it's some very salesy in when it comes to uh, you know uh, I have to tooling, but because they're all of them to really understand the how applications work and what those vulnerabilities uh, are gonna uh, are gonna be. You really, really have to do a deep dive in into sales code bases. I feel like um, I we get hire more innovative uh, only than I do either previous previous dev you know black hat and folks or people who have a heavy interest in coding. So they all have you know to understand applications you know, and I will how they're built and, and how they work. Um, you know, that's super important to be able to do AppSec well. You still I do all the normal pen with. testing, and dynamic I'll testing, them and say, but um, hey, our focus and, is always doing you know, manual then they'll reviews. Me to their we happy do hour that tools. Night. We're a big we'll, fan of SunGrab we'll make more connections um, just because it's, and, it's you know, fast leave, to run. It's also really easy to customize, but not super heavy on the tool side just to really dig into things manually. So we find these days that most apps, it's not like the OAuth top 10, from scheduling the other ago. meetings with potential like partners. Most and modern apps going are going to be and have SQL the injection in the login page. They're not going to have and command injection filling up your calendar all with We do see that here and there still, um, with, unfortunately, with but we see a lot less and, of that with modern applications. And, you know, doing what we that see hustle, more that's what I was now doing is and that's kind what of I do authentication and authorization you know, issues. So a lot of times so I'm lack running of authentication from on meeting certain meeting. resources or, you know, um, a good one recently with was one uh, an authorization issue across another a GraphQL partner. Um, Interface. And really filling and so up my that, day with that, that kind of thing rather than going is really to hard for tools to find. Vegas, so a lot of that comes down to someone uh, understanding how the and system actually kind of works. How I approach it usually is finding ways you know, to break your those, calendar can become those kind of controls. Everybody's reaching out um, to you. Hey, can you meet? So yeah, a lot um, of it is a on pretty day. manual process. Still. And yeah, I'd imagine that authorization levels of that, you know, that are kind of hard coded in or you know the way the application is architected, you know, whether regardless of what modern authentication method it's using uh you know there's if, if people are writing the application wrong it could give somebody too much permission um across an application or access to a database etc so um i can see where that would need some kind of manual help where an automated tool would just be like oh you're using no off two you're good you know um rather than 
really understanding, you know, that, hey, this is any standard user can authenticate and now get access to all the user's data. You know, that that's yeah. something that really would would take a manual effort to look at and really understand the scope of what's supposed to happen. Yeah, yeah, Got sure. So, now, as far as, you know, when you guys are engaged, do you look at the CICD process too and look at really kind of like how from from code design to implementation, how it's deployed, how it's compiled, uh, you know, and, and look at that um, as a point where there may be a security failure in that process? Yeah, I think CICD. There's there's two big areas we look at. Um, a, Where what I are the a lot of security value to controls and testing and then that uh, the are in place? Afterwards are because I mean, I know kind of I think there's been a, a series of articles recently about how but, uh, uh, DevSecOps you know, is, like is dead, but when I'm not quite and not quite I'm bought into that quite meetings, yet. Because I think are a lot of them are very there's still a lot of our opportunity there to implement security controls into DevOps processes. So we definitely look at how do you do any security in your pipelines um, how do you, you know, give that makes, developers it's feedback hard to do, as but, soon as possible uh, when on, you're at a party like, you know, the code quality the code security that they're putting out there and same thing on the infrastructure as code side say, for okay, hey, infrastructure guys, pipelines you we've know, done a lot of work in the terraform space using? to basically help people you know, build what, more how secure how these pipelines problems? um and I could rant know, about that those, for a few days, that but that's actually an area I'm for not that blue teamers that like there's a huge app. opportunity there I'm to not, you know, secure your so cloud that, infrastructure that's, that's through really your pipeline. Apps like is still tough, really like I talked about. Like, as far you can find easy patterns uh, a way to really with tools, but connection. the more complex stuff is still hard to detect with tools. On the cloud side, there's a lot of opportunities to solve a lot of the misconfiguration issues we see um, through tooling in pipelines. So that's definitely one part. The other side to it is um, Pipelines are often one of the biggest sources of, um, you know, privilege escalation and access into environments because people, uh, I always joke when I do talks about this, but I say like, how many folks know that they have the admin access policy tied to their pipeline for their infrastructure? And usually at least one or two hands go up. And, you know, it's something to think about is if someone gets access to your pipeline, what can they do? Can they, you know, yep. Put in a new yeah, user a and delete all the other users, users lock you out themselves. of your account. Can um, they as well. you know, so, dump all your S3 buckets uh, out you know, So looking at the privileges that pipelines are using is really another big focus of, of ours. You can usually tell security based on like how mature you know, maybe dev black teams' pipelines hacker, are, how much how many security, so, security like, controls they've put into place, how well they trim down privileges for those pipelines. You can kind of tell based on that how good the code quality is going to be. Uh, so those two things kind culture, of work but everyone's kind of um, if if dev, that, team, dev teams are taking um, their pipeline you know, security and their hair down, you know, they're not wearing seriously, they're wearing their flashback. Usually the code base is gonna be a good bit better. Um, it's and almost we've, like like you know, we work with some customers who are like that. They have really good practices, um, the even without the security time, team. But you're learning you know, a lot. Pushing them to do that, they and then have really there's good practices and there's parties on that side. And, and then there's some folks who just have pipelines and that get the code out the door, and it, they're not doing is, much DevSecOps there. But take it full, full. yeah, there's a big opportunity there to kind of assist people and do a deep dive into how that's being done. Um, I'm a big believer in automating as much as you can on the security side because we'll never scale to have enough people internally to solve all the issues. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I I feel like we could talk about you know CI/CD and DevOps security forever. Um, you know, I'd like to dig into a, it a little bit more. Uh, I know you know some of our audience understands what we're talking about, and some of you may be like, "What is CI/CD? What's DevOps? Uh, what is all this?" So I'll just kind of give a you know really DevOps is a kind of a modern or more modern approach to, um, you know, writing code and, and deploying infrastructure uh, in an efficient way, and usually with a team that is kind of coordinating that and, and kind of a process that's coordinating that. And really CICD, you know, is usually your, your pipeline for development and deployment of, of code. So when your developers, you know, write code for your company, how does that actually get into the wild? And nowadays we use automated systems for that. And when we talk about your CI CD system, that's really what we're talking about. Um, so Mike, before we go on, you have anything to add there? I really oversimplified it for some of the people <laughs> that may be listening. 
but no, no, I think that's, that's definitely a good, uh, a good explanation. Um, a colleague of mine will say that DevSec, DevOps and DevSecOps, um, is more about culture than pipelines, but mm -hmm. my brain is still yep. firmly stuck in the, how do you automate things and, and have technical processes, but Ken, I'll give you a shout out for, for, uh, you know, promoting the other side, the culture side of DevOps and DevSecOps. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, to me, it's more of a cultural thing and more of a team thing than it is a automation thing. I think, uh, you know, automation is kind of a core value of DevOps, mm -hmm. but, uh, it's, it's not, you know, DevOps is really combining those development and operation concepts into one team so that you can get things done faster. And, uh, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, I wanted to give people a short intro to that before, you know, we kept going. Uh, but to me, when you were just talking about really security, you, you talked about a lot of things with CICD uh, that, you know, are are kind of places where you see gaps. And it can get really complicated, people's CICD uh, pipelines, you know, people's processes. Or it can be really manual, which can be even worse, because then it's hard to backtrace what everybody's doing. Um, so when you're looking at an organization, obviously every company is different. Everybody's using different technology. Everybody has different processes. What are some common low hanging fruit you see? You mentioned credentials as one, um, maybe role inspection or user access or something like that. But uh, what is something that like, if you wanted to give people just uh, kind of a, a couple pointers on low hanging fruit to look at in there, in their development pipeline as far as a way to ramp up their security a little bit more um, besides calling you guys in to help. Um, yeah. Any ideas? Yeah. Uh, a few come to mind. I think one big thing, and it goes back to the credential leakage that we see in the cloud is um, most folks, they set up GitHub Actions or a Jenkins pipeline to deploy out apps or deploy out infrastructure, and they just um, put some hard-coded credentials maybe in a .env file or, you know, maybe in like a secret store. Um, and these days we don't really have to do those things when we're working in the cloud space. Um, GitHub and and AWS support OIDC, which is a authentication and trust method where you can basically set up a GitHub pipeline to be trusted by your AWS environment. That basically means that it gives you a couple of good benefits. Wow. A, no hard coded credentials. There's a trust relationship versus Hard coded credentials, so there's nothing to be exposed we'll or probably someone, be you know, in the like, wrong. I'll just grab these I'll and do some quick testing locally and then forget than... to delete them and send it onto a laptop <laughs> and you know, grab those credentials off. You basically <laughs> never have to introduce yeah. hard coded credentials <laughs> to the environment. So that's one big benefit. I think the other thing is that if you if you shape your pipelines well on that side, you can start with a limited set of uh a limited set of access, which you know building truly least privileged policies is not easy i'm not going to say it's like you know a, a 15 minute exercise it takes a lot of work um and there's some good tools like aws has an access analyzer that can actually build a least privileged policy based on cloud trail um activities so you can actually run your pipeline it'll build a policy based on that which is helpful i will say though it's not without its issues and you'll still run into access issues and you have to go figure out what i have to add and things like that so you know, this is not an easy problem to to solve. I'm not going to say it's, you know, I don't blame a lot of teams for having too many permissions. It's not always easy to solve, but it's definitely worthwhile up front trying to figure out how you can set up, even if it's a broad set of permissions, at least limit it somewhat. Your pipelines don't need to create IEM users. They probably don't need to delete your account. They don't need to, you know, do a lot of different things. So try to limit those um, policies up front as much as possible. So I'd say that's definitely one um, one uh, aspect of it. I think the other thing is implement some security tools early on. So if you're doing app development, yeah, I, I think there's grab something like a lot of those or a language that specific tool in that in you know, they're using um, and grab you know, something Black Cat just helps like dependency check or sneak but to do some of dependency that, review. You know, that's not a um, internally, not, we you know, use dependency which is another good or, tool from GitHub, or that's but not if you're a, not on GitHub, then you can use one of those other tools. The well, earlier you I get mean, these things into your the pipelines and from fixing the provider, stuff, from, the better you know, because uh, if Gardner, you, et cetera, you know, create all a huge amount of code, you run a pen you know, or some and, grab uh, or from what I'm saying, it is, against it, you're going to have a huge amount of work to do down the line. It's easier to just 
uh, the same stuff that I would pay a guy three weeks and to do, do things manually. In a, in a this thing can do in 45 minutes. Fact, uh, fashion, just hammering the system. Then, you know, yeah, and, being like, yeah, we'll do security and at the end. It's and really then realizing pain, you just use a bunch of insecure dependencies thing. and your code is dependent on those dependencies. Those and you have to rewrite stuff at the last minute or just have a same kind of CB10 in your app when you're doing it out the door. So. Um, when they I don't think so people need like, to boil the ocean. We're like, coming don't, a long don't way. Don't think you have to fix every have low, at, medium, at like or code quality, quality issues that come out of these tools. Out. Try to focus on the highs and criticals first, because that's really going to reduce your risk the most. But start early, do it as often as possible. Just get into the habit of addressing these issues, and you'll save yourself a lot of work, um, both on the app and the infrastructure side. So um, I think the tooling these days has gotten a lot better. And I'm always a big fan of of free and fast tooling. So things like SEMGRAP or dependency check are great tools to have in the have in the tool set. And and awesome. and talk on about the infrastructure and it side, doesn't, which is where you know, all of you can um, challenge your more, hey, What do you think you about know, this? Paid, what about this? Uh, like, and, and work through those for, thought processes you know, and not be configuration management. It's the one place where you don't have to be the expert like in the room. Because um, let's face so it, as the CISOs awesome that are rolling around everywhere can grab, of course there's a level of you're the expert in the room. You know, it's like the, the CIO is the executive help really desk, it, and you're the executive uh, hacker. That I think you're supposed to know all uh, hacker really stuff, all the things. To all and of like, our this, listeners, you know, know everything. There's no way. Like, this is the one place now. where um, you can you not be the expert in the room, Azure, you challenge your assumptions. Hey, I'm hearing about this. What do you think about this? You know, And have these. Have there a debate. Tools like, hey, there. There are, it's automated pen testing good enough. Well, it's good enough for this. It's, you know, here's maybe where it's right and left lateral limit is. But it is far more, far more. To, to if you can get more kind of use out of it, there. it's going to provide a better outcome. Is there anything right? from the like, infrastructure side that you can think of? If people aren't, like, let's say they're not using DevOps, and like we can talk they about that infrastructure somebody manually in, in a collegial there. forum, um, and not get canceled. You know, uh, and, you know, is there anything that you would do? You know, and, and have people your, there. That's why, like, uh, make sure who's you know who's at the party. It's all people that like are awesome, like that are how do you good at what they do? And you maybe hang out with some weird, strange. people. Yeah, I mean, um, again, I'm a, a big fan of recommending free tools that people can just grab, knowing that budgets and and you know resource constraints are always present with security teams. Um, I mean, from a cloud infrastructure perspective, if you're if you're doing everything manually, mm -hmm. you can't. It's hard to do preventative controls. Yeah, but let's definitely let's, use things I did like get a crayon too, Azure so. policies or <laughs> AWS uh, service control policies up front to kind of limit the blast radius of things or just kind of limit. Um, the access you give people. Those are two really powerful tools. Um, I think Azure definitely nailed it with with those policies. And I've seen really secure environments based on using those policies um, and conditional access as well. So they definitely have some, mm -hmm. some big advantages there. Um, but SCP's service control policies on the AWS side are another good preventative control that is built in. Um, again, it's, it's not without its issues and you're going to shoot yourself in the foot at some point and, and limit some access, but you can go back and kind of fix those those issues. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in the cloud space, uh, I think Prowler is another good open source tool to run against your environment. <laughs> it does basically configuration reviews on your AWS or Azure um, environments. Oh, yeah. They, they well, started dive into adding more now. Azure support uh, and more, more folks with, moving into like, Azure. So okay, the, the general rule, again, it's free, it's open you source. Out, you can run it in about 15 minutes against an three, account. Two, one and, rule. That you um, need three hours you know, of sleep, if you discover a bunch at least two meals of public, a day, and public at least one data, shower. This is daily. Or, so you know, don't try to skip your shower. RDS you'll snapshots, think everybody like will that. know. Like, and you, know, well you may not the know, but everybody else knows. To understand and, what's out there. You know, without those two um, meals, you're going to be drinking, you're going to be running around. A lot of you, 20,000 people a day on your Fitbit. See people struggle with the basics. When we first come in to do one, usually the first one we do, it's kind of an eye opener for folks. They don't realize kind of how bad things are, but... May, Most people may aren't seem the time easy now, but when you're in party mode, these types of reviews. sometimes three hours, um, you know, but the good thing is you kind of get into the, the flow of doing it more often, and, and then you get into it, building it, patterns it around hard. deploying so, things securely uh, but, versus yeah. so if deploying we them insecurely, then doing a test, then going to get it fixed. You know, that's really what we want to try. You're on a budget, you don't have, you kind of get across the people as the more prevention, the easier life is. Not just from a breach avoidance perspective, that's obviously the biggest goal, but even from just like a rework perspective, um, the last rework you have to do going back and encrypting buckets or encrypting EBS volumes, um, all of that, like it just is gonna save not only your security teams, but also your app teams a huge amount of time. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities there to do preventative work, so. Yeah, and I know that uh, some organizations, especially smaller ones, 
they uh, struggle implementing a lot of the you know service control policies and a lot of the you know Azure policies because they're uh, you know some of them their teams are kind of handling everything mm -hmm. and they don't really role base themselves really well um, you know but still there's there's some defaults that you want to set and there's some uh, you know some policies where okay anytime I'm creating this kind of storage is that it needs to be encrypted you know anytime etc you know we're always requiring this kind of key or we're always using this this key vault um you know setting up those kind of standards is that something that your organization can help um a company figure out yeah for sure and i mean i think i think our goal and and most companies goals um small or medium or large is you're not going to go from zero to secure day one. You know, it's a it's a journey. But the more you do up front, the easier life is down the line. Um, don't try to go from, you know, oh, it's a wild west to the NSA. No, like, we didn't go there. You're not going to accomplish that, A, and you're just going to make your app team's lives miserable. So figure out, you know, the broad strokes that you can do to, to kind of um, reduce risk, things like um, managing, like, what regions you use, managing services, like, really try to move to those role-based policies as early as possible. Not that it has to be like, you know, we use these three permissions and it's limited to these three permissions, but the more that you can do, um, the better. And definitely move to short-term credentials upfront. Um, we've done this with with clients where, you know, day one, they're using Identity Center versus every, every dev has hardcore credentials. Just get away from, using those long credential, long live credentials, and you're not going to have the the dev who accidentally pushes to the wrong repo. And now you're dealing with someone, you know, setting up servers and crypto mining or grabbing your data, whatever it is. So like, just get into those practices early. Um, and things are just a lot easier than they used to be, honestly. Like it's not as hard as it used to, to be to do this stuff. There's a reason why for a long mm -hmm. time people did do hard coded credentials because there weren't as many services, but now okay. it doesn't take too long to get this yeah, stuff set up with Identity there. Center, federate from whatever, you know, identity source you have so you can keep all your lifecycle rules if you have them on, you know, user access, things like that. Like okay. it's not, it's we not too know, difficult to do um, in the smaller medium sizes. It definitely gets more and more complex over time, but um, it's definitely worth trying to get to that model as soon as possible. Um, then you can do more and more controls on top of that. You don't have to do you know, everything up front, do the minimum up front, and then just kind of build towards that more secure standpoint. Definitely a more consumable model that way is, you know, just continuous improvement, but just take small pieces at the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, in the infrastructure side, we're always talking about zero trust lately. Is that something that has really kind of infected the AppSec mindset yet? That's a good question. Oh my um, gosh! Like they I don't know. have everything. I don't, like, I don't think so. You know, breakfast I think, is phenomenal there, um, and I mean no slight to developers there. in this, but I think a lot and of developers are focused on getting work you know, done. But the incentive with I mean, a lot of app teams is to amazing, get but you know get the code uh, out there, get the get not, the work done. Not and a big house. So a lot of times you see security like issues because make my list someone has set up a security process that, about Frankie, that is so onerous that app teams find a way around it um, to to get the work done. You know, like their boss doesn't necessarily care about the security controls. They care about the sprint being wrapped up with tickets being closed out. So I still see a lot of trust issues when it comes to apps and the roles they use and the access they have to secrets and the access they have to data. Like there's... I don't think we've gotten to a great point with segmentation there. Um, definitely some improvement, but yeah, I think if you look at most cloud-based apps, they have a little too much access to things than they need. Um, if you have, you know, star on resource for secrets manager for all your apps, like, you know, that's just, they have way too much access. Um, I think it's just been more of a struggle there and security teams, I don't think have as good of a yep. insight into that because they don't always understand the the relationships with apps and infrastructure and inner app relationships, things like that. It's just harder to reason about that without really digging into the code and understanding how these things work. And a lot of teams, security teams don't have time to do that. Um, so they're kind of working from 
from the higher level. So I need to um, tickets. So I think that area is still a bit of a struggle. Okay. Yeah. And besides this yeah, local, like, like there's besides this design, so much that is happening it's right now in the community driven, it's all volunteers. There's really no pay to play. Needs to um, almost change how we're thinking about what's awesome about how B sides work as opposed to deaf you know, let's say you're uh, a little overwhelmed. More ephemeral, let's say you're a uh, more, you know Nothing you don't like big crowds. So DEF CON and, 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 and Black Hat can be very overwhelming because there's so much stuff. It's hard to meet people, um, like blah, 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 really, blah. We're just not there yet. The best way, and, so you get a, you, you, yeah, if you go um, to Vegas B-Sides, you know, it's like 3,000 really person like cap. With zero trust uh, principles, four of the talks all funnel into the and saying, main area. Okay, so like you're the constantly like running into people. And which is really cool um, here but really and nothing you else is there touching this. and i recommend and, this if you're and uh, i've and had to see so for maris oil and gas guardrails around volunteering it. so like you, you never know who your side, how we do it is your, i go your roamer app, your battle buddy is but say, okay you, you know, now have 100 new friends rolling into DEF CON. So this is a great way to meet people. Three months, to, you know, let's say you're you going know, to Black Hat for a few and things. Get segmentation right, get the maybe volunteer, right. volunteering um, in the community probably is a great way to meet people. Do some stuff there. For a dev team to you know, do now, that because yeah, like, like, now you have new friends and it's a smaller conference. So you'll get great talks. So. If, if that's what you're into, you'll get great connections. If that's what you're into, spend that effort. But it's so much smaller, and you can sit at a table and just make new friends. And that's one of the biggest things. I don't know about for you, Art, is like, application. if I'm in line. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of app teams also, we've seen a lot of issues, especially with microservice type infrastructure, um, where a lot of app teams are working off the assumption that uh, are working off of assumptions about how infrastructure works and how the, the trust relationships between apps work. Um, and what I mean is we've seen quite a bit of um, service based architecture and uh, microservices where someone writes an app, writes a microservice, and they're like, oh, well, I don't need to worry about Auth Z here because Auth Z is going to be done at the database, or Auth Z is going to be done in this service. And then that person who writes that service is like, oh, I don't need to worry about it because up front they're handling Auth Z, you know, checking the checking the yep. user identity Absolutely. against what role they have. And I so think we see that, uh, a lot of that stuff break down you know, because a lot of people come into DEF CON and, and I feel like this is kind of time, people was, have moved away from a true architect really model where they have that like, kind okay, of you know person um, I'm in the ivory tower, guy, the wizard who kind of understands all those pieces of work. People just gone to like ship code as fast. Possible. I don't even know if it works, what to it do, works. where to start, and like how to even security talk doesn't find them. anything. I'm just going to hang back. But there. having someone but, uh, who understands how all these different apps really work together and what those trust relationships there, just are, like you could say, hey, you have like a main hole here because you're making assumptions about trust relationships. Like um, we've kind of you know, lost that because we've moved away from doing more enterprise architecture, I think, especially in small companies. Like small companies don't have architects or people who act as architects. It's really just about shipping code. You know, Vegas or any other B-side. And that's an important role to really understand from a high level how these things work. And usually when they understand how they work, they understand kind of where the security gaps are with those trust models as well. So that's a really, that's an interesting area service-based microservice are architecture is where we see some arts. interesting you know, it's usually security you know issues, and especially that around off the so, um you know i i feel like like i are i'm always seeing and the well that was that's the place first place know, i ever spoke and, so they have a thing called proving ground um where it's 30 minute system, talks or it's 20 minute talks right down and you're assigned a mentor uh, you know, shout out to Dr. Bersek. Some, some uh, he was my mentor, and, and like they got I gave a talk on how to do compliance without taking everybody else. It's still on YouTube. It's like twenty minute talk, right? Infrastructure like so, then, if you want to give a talk, this is a place and, to go do it um, and start to build a reputation. Um, I guarantee none of those companies. Right? They may have. Like, that's what's great about B-Sides. Somebody, like there's an opportunity but, uh, there because like yeah, you're right. Like a lot of the other big conferences, it's who you know, what's your reputation. How There's fancy are you? How long is your beard? On the architecture you, how sweet is your tactic um, code? Like, I don't know. App dev like, side that is really um, but, uh, security focused. You're 100% you know, right. right. They're probably like, efficiency uh, focused. And that's where I think people, because it depends um, on your cybersecurity profession. So you're an executive. Probably you may have to go a lot of this over to Black Hat from. to go meet with certain so, vendors, stuff like that. You know, but you can go to B-Sides are, for your own professional development. Because I think usually the infrastructure. we get to a certain point as professionals and we forget. from that. You if realize how much you don't to know. make sure that their environments are ready for an incident. You know, um, obviously you can't fix every problem you don't know about yet. Um, 
but uh you know how do you go about like what is your without giving all the details away but if you just kind of step through a high level process of really kind of how you do your assessments to kind of validate or or assess somebody's um cloud environment uh can you walk us through kind of like what those broad strokes would look like yeah i mean i think the biggest topic there and i i i, I bet you agree with me here um and our cto john always kind of beats this drum which is logging um logs are manager, that CISO, thing that you don't like need that. until you really and, need them and, and kind of really a lot of times the they're yeah, not we'll they're not there we've been learning and staying on top of the few um, instant responses where in the, in the, you know the they have 90 days worth of really logs but the instant have been in day 92 and, so they're and understanding what technology is coming out so rather than a big than, focus of ours you know, continuing is making sure the clients do have their log set up um which may not it's somewhat easy in the cloud to turn on cloud trail or activity log just have that going you know, you get a good amount of insight into your environment not versus where I live every day, traditional you know? on-prem so, networks. You kind of have to have different log sources at different areas to really understand exactly. the full picture. <laughs> um, but the only problem exactly. I think still is people yeah. so, I mean, in short, have cloud trail like logs, but they don't always have the level of detail hat. there There's, that they need. So they have you know, to have when we're talking about applications hat, to understand including what an app is doing, hey, or even server logs to see what someone did on a server. And you should stay for DEF CON. So it's really, I always say, can you should you know, in an instant, go to who did what, talk when, to and how. And like, if you can answer those Black questions at each level of your the infrastructure, or from app Black and, to server to and, uh, network and go to, you know, cloud API level, you can, and, you're in really good and shape. Be and then really do you have about the amount of logs, the, and, the, and, you know, you know use months like and years worth of logs you need to be able to say that if you detect an incident, you know, six months or a year later. A lot of people, again, a lot of us do to licensing the, costs uh, for things like Splunk, they just here kind of keep because, 60 days, 90 days you know, worth of logs. He is Hopefully you put of the rest of them into, where you know, cold storage, I'm, you know, um, although I've been there but, several um, times, it's, it's, you know, people I'm just don't like, have okay, enough logs a lot of times eat, and they kind of okay, assume you know, 60 days will be enough, this but we've definitely this, seen incidents where, where he knows. people detect something so happened a long he, time ago and they're working off of incomplete information. Even large financials, people have the same, the same issue where, um, they have enough for 60 days, but not enough for day 62. So that's a big focus of, of having those in place. And yep. again, if you don't have them, you don't have them. You know, you can't just make them appear out of nowhere. Um, even the cloud providers can only give you so much because they're not keeping everything either. So they're not going to be able to rescue you and give you your cloud trail logs from two years ago if you didn't have it turned mm -hmm. on. So um, that's a big focus for resiliency for, for you know, there's much breach prevention, but definitely when you're in the middle grab of a bag those logs, knowing where they table, are, yep. being able to get them into a system to do log review is is huge. Um, same thing on the app side is making sure your apps are logging what they need to be logging. There's kind of a balance between too much and too little. You want to be able to say, you know, who did what. You don't want to say what data they might have done it with because that might be sensitive or... Um, you know, passwords, things like that, but you want to be able to have a good understanding of what your application is doing and what a user is doing against your application. Um, so that's super important. And most people just kind of take the, <laughs> the stock logs out of their framework yeah. or their language um, and, and yeah, run with that, but you do have to do some work said, to kind of customize um, that. To anyone who wants to hang out while happening. we're, while we're, yeah. And for retention, I usually try to aim for a year with like a SIM solution. But yeah, there are several that, that roll over after 30 or after 60. Um, and, you know, not all our clients are on a year of retention. Really, it depends on what they're willing to buy and what they want to invest in. But, uh, uh, and a lot of it may depend on kind of what kind of incidents you're commonly looking at. Uh, most ransomware lately has had like a three day dwell time. So, Usually, once somebody gets initial access to environment, they're trying to capitalize on it as fast as possible, turn it, flip it, and make money off of it. So an initial access broker will have to hack your application or hack your VPN or, or get access to your environment. Absolutely. If somebody um, and I love they're selling it. I, access immediately I love and it. Then somebody like, from a ransomware group people. Is, is using it immediately. But, uh, you know, state-level threat actor, you know, will live in there forever and just try to gather information and you know if they have other if and, you know somebody else that's not a ransomware threat actor may you know may have a goal of you know 
changing your code base or doing something else and having a, having more of a long-term vision in their attack. So uh, a longer retention Great. is definitely so, necessary. Uh, I would say right now, lately. email info at sempercent.com you know, with, with, would be the easiest you know, thing cloud we'll add you to the list. I'd, uh, I am not know, in charge of marketing anymore, so threat, I believe I we have a sign-up really page. Slowly. The reason why we need the so like, people okay. sign up um, and tell me I what you're bringing us, so make sure we have enough food, to create a new user, and, uh, and, and, we, just, and we also stuff. coordinate shuttles. So I might do uh, that, like that and wait um, for months. So before that's I do really the biggest thing. It. But so yeah, it's really it is invite just to make sure that we kind of logging solution in order to. I don't have any weirdos, you know. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Half these people just all left their mom's basement. We're all weird. You know, into the sim. You know, are there? You mentioned uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's a lot of fun and, and like please like yeah if you're if you're in the cybersecurity if, community if you want to have a good time and you're tired you, you don't want to go there. to a yeah it's usually it's usually at least extending the the built-in one you know a lot of people are just kind of grab like the Apache log mm -hmm. and that's gonna that's gonna give you certain things you know some of your headers your IP things like that but you know there's been a, Quite a few people who that IP is actually and we'll make sure that your gets proxy to, or you know your ALB, so you're just too. getting the same IP again and again. So um, you know you got to think through that. Yeah. Doing doing kind of uh, yeah, it's not quite a so tabletop, a lot, but doing Rob. kind this of a mock a IR session. engagement where you're uh, like, all right, let's, to let's, this let's act like and whatever platform someone you're listening on. You know, use an all new episode bug in our app to grab out every other how would we detect what they for did more information and what the on scope Arium, is. Um, and then working backwards from, okay, and for more we can't see these activities. How do we build this into our logging framework? Um, you don't always have to build a huge amount of custom logic it's a lot of it is just making sure the right fields are getting logged and those logs aren't just sitting on a server that's rotating them every you know 60 days but actually getting sent to somewhere central um i don't think all that is stuff you have to keep you know in in like every single app has to have every single log in your seam i think a lot of times you can keep that in something like s3 and pull it in when you need it versus cloud trail i think that's something you should have in your seam all the time um but you know, it really depends on what your what your Splunk budget is and and what your volume is. So um, infinite Splunk budget, throw it all in there. You know, absolutely. That that seems to be the balance now. Is you know whether whether you're running your own and you are paying for storage then, or whether you're paying a provider for a, a certain number of events or log entries. Um, you know, it seems to be a balance and. It's unfortunate because we're having to choose not to log certain things because of cost rather than because of some other functional reason. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So in, in tying it back to IR a little bit more, um, you know, I know we can pull you in anytime that there's anything that's really, that uh, we need somebody to do kind of a cloud a look at the cloud, um, you know, security of a, of a situation or the code um, on the pre-breach side, you tell people how to get a hold of you if they want to. Yeah, we're cloudsecuritypartners.com. Um, I'm easy to reach on LinkedIn as well, Mike McCabe. And um, so you can always reach out to us and, you know, we, we want to do as much work, no offense, Art, we want to do as much work on our side so they don't have to call you in, um, oh, yeah. you know, but um, yeah, I mean, the earlier you engage security, uh, as much as Art is a great guy, the little, you know, a little less time you have to spend with him when things happen. Um, so, you know, doing threat modeling, architecture reviews, risk reviews, all that stuff up front will save you some time down the line. And you can just go grab a beer with Art instead. Absolutely. I like that idea better. Um, you know, I always, you know, even though I'm, I'm doing incident response, I, I advocate for me not to have to see people. It's kind of like being an emergency room doctor, you know, yeah. it's, uh, you know, I'd rather them get the help first. That yeah. way, uh, you know, I can, I can pivot my career towards pre-breach stuff and not have to focus on <laughs> cleaning people up afterwards. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. Uh, anything else you'd like to add before uh, before we close up for today? No. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I kind of covered most of it. But yeah, well, there's much work you can do up front. Um, you know, build a build an empathetic roadmap for for your teams to to try to be more secure over time, 
and security is super daunting for a lot of folks but it doesn't have to be and it, it really can be kind of a step-by-step -step process so um the best thing to do is start today so well thanks so much mike for your time today this is a great discussion i feel like i could deep dive into devops cicd security for a long time with you uh even leaving the rest of it alone but i know we could probably run a whole episode on cloud configuration management and probably show people some of the key things there. Um, there's there's a whole can of worms here. Uh, so it's something that I implore everybody who's listening to do that, you know, if you have a cloud environment, don't assume that you're secure just because you're in the cloud. That is a common problem. You know, everyone is trying to mitigate their risk by shifting infrastructure to the cloud and shifting applications to the cloud. and you really have the same risk. It's just in a different kind of technology now. And you're accessing it via API instead of pulling logs now. It's it's it's, it's the same problems. It's just a different world you're living in. So uh, this was a great discussion. And uh, please subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Uh, new episodes are usually coming out about every other Wednesday. And for more information on us, on Arium, visit www.arium.com.